You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Florian Newkirk. He's the principal scientist at Volkswagen. So, uh, Florian, how are you doing? I'm very good. Thanks. I hope you're fine as well. Yeah. Did I pronounce Volkswagen? Uh, I know there's the American way, but I guess the the real pronunciation is probably like Volkswagen or something. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds better than what I could say. <laughs> okay, okay. It's Volkswagen. That's yeah. Good. <laughs> well, cool. So, what? Um, and I have in my notes that uh, you're using um, or you're studying quantum effects as they relate to batteries in cars. Or yeah, you know, what are you working on? Can you clarify that? Yes. Yeah, of course. So yeah, one of our um, um, fields of interest is quantum computing and our material simulation. So the thing that you just mentioned that is one of the most interesting things. But actually, we're working in four different areas. But um, starting with material simulation, so you can. Imagine we use one quantum system to simulate another quantum system. So it means we, we simulate atoms and molecules. And uh, by doing that exactly, we hope to have a better or get a better understanding of materials properties. And that could be useful um, for battery materials, let's say cathode or anode materials. So anything that helps you to build better batteries. And uh, so classically, and anytime I say classically, I mean with computers that are not quantum computers, you can do these kinds of simulation, but only approximately. So the more complex your molecule or your material becomes, the more inaccurate your, your simulation is. So, and that's why um, not only we, but actually most of the research group in quantum computing think that simulating um, quantum effects with a quantum computer um, could be a killer app, so to say, for quantum computing. So that's, the, that's one area. So another area we are very interested in is machine learning. So we look into into algorithms like artificial neural networks. So any algorithm that learns from data um, and take the toughest parts of these algorithms and see if we can embed it on quantum processors, on quantum computers, and see if we can um, either become algorithms or get algorithms that, that are more accurate, that learn faster. So this is mm. usually the challenge. And then another, yeah, you have a question? Yeah, well... First, I just want to ask you about batteries. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's not course. silly, but uh, I don't know. I don't think batteries seem to be that complex. I mean, where, what kind of complexity is there that needs to be modeled using, uh, you know, quantum computing? Yeah. So when you imagine a molecule, so what you have is lots of moving parts. So you have atomic nuclei. So uh, they move slower than electrons, but still they move. Then you have electrons um, that you have in clouds around these nuclei. And these electrons interact with all the other um, electrons and they interact with the nuclei. And uh, the more atoms you have, the more complex these interactions become. This means that um, at a certain degree, so let's say we, we're interested in simulating uh, molecules with 1,000, 1,500 electrons, um, it becomes impossible to do that with, with today's computers. So the computers that we use, doesn't matter if it's a data center or just the fast computer under your desk. It's intractable, so and uh, you may, must make some assumptions. So you can assume, for example, that the nuclei um, they don't move, but in reality they move. So they are just a lot slower than electrons. But what we really want is simulate this behavior exactly. And uh, what we are after is is it's called the ground state. So any physical system over time will take the ground state, so the minimum energy configuration, and this is the best approximation to. The wave function, so the thing that we want to understand. So, and uh, that's why we hmm. use quantum computers to simulate that behavior exactly. And still, we're not there. So we're not um, um, 
um, approaching industry relevant materials within this year or next year. But what we can do is simulate small uh, molecules like lithium hydride, beryllium oxide. And these are not battery materials, but these um, simulations, they give us an understanding of how we can use quantum computers um, to, to solve such kind of problems. And once we have more powerful quantum computers over the next five, 10 years, um, then we can use these algorithms that we developed today to simulate um, um, industry relevant materials, hopefully. So that's the, that's the idea behind it. Even in um, simulating just a molecule, I mean, what, I, I guess you've seen quantum simulations of uh, just a molecule, like you said, lithium hydride. What have yeah. we learned from those kind of simulations that we didn't know before? Do you see like structural elements so, or other elements or things that, you know, I guess weren't apparent? Mm -hmm. Like what have you learned from that? So here it's, so for simple systems, we can still do that classically and we can do it exactly. But the, the learning that we get out of it is how to use um, existing quantum hardware um, to solve such kinds of problems. So how do you, how do you develop um, an algorithm that does exactly what you want, so that, that finds the ground state of a molecule. So, and that's different because right now we don't have a different compared to classical computers because we don't have programming language as specifically developed for quantum computers. So we still operate on a bit level. So we, we access single bits and we have to represent our problem, whatever it is, as a graph, you could say, um, or as a sequence of gates, depending on which, which computer you use. So there are annealing systems and gate model computers and uh, those function slightly differently, but for this specific problem, you may you may use both. So, but still, we have to access single bits and find a way to represent the problem such that that we can solve it as a um, on a bit level and represent it as a bit level. So, and that's um, that's the the biggest learning we get out of it. So, how do we write algorithms that can execute something on a quantum chip? So, for a battery, what would you be looking to optimize? Just the efficiency of the battery, or you know, what, what would this show you? So when you find better materials, so one thing that could be interesting is, um, so you want to um, increase the durability. So you want to be able to recharge it more often, or you want to maybe increase the range, so get more energy out of it and store more energy in the battery. So everything that could help us make batteries better, um, that's that's what we're interested in. Okay, so it's more of a search for new materials or... Um... Yes, exactly. Well, let me ask you. So, mm -hmm. What what makes a better battery? You said one that can be recharged more without loss, and then uh, what materials yeah. that just have a larger, um, I guess, a larger capacity to take in electrons and then give them away? Or what, you know, what yes. elements make a battery better than than others? Yes, so it's the materials that you use, so the battery chemistry that you want to improve. So that's specifically what we're after. And uh, right now, for the classical simulations, you can make some educated guesses. So you can um, stack together molecules on um, a limited number of atoms that you know could be interesting for battery materials. But um, in reality, so I'm um, not a, a chemist by education, but um, we have chemists in our company, and those are the guys I talk to when I want to know what, what we have to do. In reality, um, what, what you really want to do is take as many combinations of atoms and stack it together, so possible combinations, to molecules and see if any of these could be useful for whatever you want to do with your battery. So whatever, so let's say you want to find a new cathode material, you want to figure out what combination is the best for this. So but right now we only use a limited number of atoms that we stack together and it's based on educated guesses. But in reality, we don't really know. So ideally um, we, can, we can simulate through the whole periodic table and see if we can find something that's, that's better than what we have now. Okay, and what happens when you uh, recharge your battery? Why is there, uh, over time, you can't recharge it anymore? Why are there losses? What happens there? So over time, you'll see um, cracks in the microstructures of the materials. So it's like using, uh, so anything that you use over time, it will degrade. And this is the same with batteries and happen with the battery chemistry. So um, you may see this with your smartphone. So over time, the battery gets worse. So the more often you recharge it, um, the worse it gets. So and this is because um, tiring of the materials. So and uh, it's just um, using it too much. So and what we really want is maybe something that's more durable. So. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. That's no, true. I mean, as I've uh, as I use and cycle a battery, let's say in a smartphone, it, it yeah. may charge, but it uh, it 
you know, the battery goes much, much faster. The lifetime seems to like be cut in half after a while and then it gets worse and worse. It does. Yeah. All right. So, um, you mentioned a little bit in your talk that, uh, you said the nucleus of an atom moves, not just the electrons. Can you, uh, go into a little bit more detail about that? What did you mean? Yeah, of course. So, um, you can imagine um, a molecule or the electron surrounding um, an atom, it's in constant move. So it's actually uh, the case that um, the position of each of the um, electrons is associated with a certain probability, so where you want to find it. So, um, or where you will find it once you look at it, basically. So and, uh, what this means is that um, um, everything you could imagine it somehow is being moving parts. Um, so this, ele- this molecule is not static, um, it's, it's all its parts are constantly moving. So, and uh, electrons move faster compared to nuclei, and nuclei are slower. And uh, what we do with our simulation, for example, is um, we um, move um, the nuclei apart. So, say, what's the um, energy surface when it's one angstrom apart? What's the energy surface when it's two angstrom apart? Or the energy configuration. So, in this, when we when we do this in our simulation, then this gives us the understanding of of the energy of the whole energy surface of the molecule that we need to um, to understand materials properties better. Mm, okay. So, what what else are you uh, using to model? You said batteries, uh, and what else? Yeah. So, machine learning is one of the areas that are very interesting. So, where we try to um, either find algorithms that that are they don't have any classical counterpart. So where we use the topological properties of a quantum chip, and um, so let's say for a clustering algorithm, um, when you there is a concept or an algorithm in, in machine learning, it's called a self-organizing feature map. You can imagine it as being a map of neurons um, stacked together, and uh, you send a signal towards these neurons, and the area where it fires strongest, um, this will give you the cluster. So it's very often used in um, handwritten, handwritten digits recognition, for example. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out when you look at a quantum chip and it doesn't matter which one it is, it looks very similar um, to a neural network. So you have nodes and uh, you have connections between these nodes. So your qubits and weighted connections between these qubits. And uh, when you when you look at that, then it only becomes natural to, to try to embed a neural network on a quantum chip and see if we can get some advantages. So maybe train neural networks faster or get configurations that are more accurate than the um, configurations that we've had classically. So that's one of the areas where we think quantum computing will help us in the future. So it's not that we want to have our chips or quantum chips in, let's say, self-driving vehicles, um, but we want to train models with quantum chips and take these trained models and then embed it or use it in in whatever product um, it could be useful for. And then... So, hmm, that's interesting. Um, I guess... In a classical computer, when it's running a neural network, it's it's a very iterative process in order to get to an answer. It is, but yeah. Quantum computing, you get more simultaneous possible answers, or you know, you could explore, I guess, the uh, the surface of the answer space. So yes, is it is it because it's less iterative? There's less steps that it can maybe find parts of the answer space that you know a classical computer couldn't. Yeah. So. Um, we could show in, in one of the um, examples that we developed that you could assume multiple configurations of neural networks at once. So let's say 10 configurations of neural networks, so with different weights of, of one neural network, and figure out in one function calls and one call to the quantum chip which configuration of these 10 configurations is the best. So if you compare this to the classical world, you would maybe have to evaluate all 10 configurations separately. And again, you can make some assumptions and say maybe... I already only look at parts of the configuration and can tell that this one is no good. But maybe you um, then still have to evaluate seven configurations. And that's different with a quantum chip. So it's still an iterative algorithm. So the one that we developed, and there's not only the one we have, so there's lots of other research going on in terms of neural networks. But the one that we have, it would give you, out of how many configurations you're able to, to map on a chip, would give you the best configuration with one function call. And then you can take this best configuration and maybe introduce some jittering around the weights of this neural network, and then again create ten neural networks and get the best configuration out of it again. So, and um, here um, the the possibilities today are limited because of the the sizes of the chips. So, what you could do then is um, maybe just use the quantum chip for pre-training and then refine the neural network with a classical algorithm. So, use this the result produced by quantum chip to 
uh, as an input for a classical algorithm and then refine it and continue training. But still, it's, mm. it's an open research field. This is one, one way to do it. So this is not the only way. So another thing that we could show is with reinforcement learning, so the, um, that we um, could find the optimal policy, or actually we wanted to find the, the optimal policy. So imagine you have a self-driving vehicle and you want to um, train this self-driving vehicle to execute parking maneuvers. So then one way to do it is um, you have a driver and record his behavior or her behavior, um, let's say one million times. And any time um, good parking maneuver was executed, you reward this behavior and the bad parking maneuver, like hitting a hydrant or um, not really being um, exactly parked in a parking spot, is bad behavior. So um, you punish it. And this could be used for an algorithm to learn the optimal behavior. So it's called the optimal policy, what to do in any given situation based on past behavior. And uh, so what you can do is, um, instead of taking this driver, uh, make simulations. So simulate 1 million parking maneuvers and use this as a training data. But then um, the more observations you have, the longer it will take the algorithm to find the optimal policy and uh, the uh, more complicated it becomes. So let's say you want to simulate in real time, um, almost real time, and find optimal policy based on new behavior um, or new dynamics around the vehicle. And this may be challenging. So it may take too long to find the solutions and you can't do it. So again, you must rely on trained models. But if you can do that faster, and we could show that with a quantum chip, we can embed all these observations that we have or simulations of behavior, then the quantum chip will act as a sort of filter. So it doesn't give you back the optimal policy, but let's say you have 1 million observations. It will, uh, once you embed all these observations, it will give you... Um, Two thirds less of the observations. So let's say you end up with 300,000, 30 or 300,000 observations. And if you use that and feed it into a classical algorithm, the result it finds will be equally good as what you would have found with all 1 million observations. That was an interesting result for us too. So and, um, still, um, we we're working on it to get the optimal policy out of it. But right now, the quantum chip acts as a sort of filter. So it filters out all the um, irrelevant observations that do not positively or negatively contribute to this optimal policy. So and this in turn results in a classical algorithm that's a lot faster than the original classical algorithm. So you can do much faster training because of the simultaneity of uh, quantum computing. And then also, I guess you, you're saying you can get rid of outliers that would uh, yes. hinder, hinder the tuning of an algorithm? Yeah, I wouldn't say hinder. So the interesting result was um, that the policy that we find with these um, filtered observations um, is equally good than the policy that we would find with all the observations. So ideally, or in the classical world, you would always use all the observations because you don't want to, to um, um, forget any, any data point that could be relevant. But um, for this quantum um, algorithm that we developed, it turns out that the chip um, is capable of filtering the, the observations that make no positive or negative contribution um, is capable of filtering it out. So that was an interesting thing. This is a big, um, it's a big research field in reinforcement learning too, in classical reinforcement learning, how to determine the episodes or the, the observations that are relevant for training the algorithm for finding this optimal policy. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So um, how powerful are the quantum computers that, uh, that you're able to have access to? Are they powerful enough or is it, you know, what's, where's the, um, the bottleneck here? Is it the power of the systems you're able to use or is it, you know, the idea that how to use them? So um, we currently use or work with two different kinds of quantum chips. So one is the quantum annealing system, which is a special purpose quantum computer, very suitable for optimization problems. And the other one is a gate model computer. And the gate model computer is um, a lot, so gate model or universal quantum computer. Universal already implies that you can use it for solving any arbitrarily complex problem, so, and it works slightly different. But gate model computers are more difficult to, to develop, and uh, so those chips are smaller today. You can use them for, for proving that an algorithm works, but we're not there yet that we can use it for industry-relevant problems. For quantum annealing mm -hmm. systems, on the other hand, if you have an optimization problem that's, that's industry-relevant, we currently see um, a little more than 2,000 qubits, so that's already something that could be used for, for solving um, something that helps our customers or so helps us to get better in, in whatever it is. So we could show that with, with graphical optimization, some logistics problems that we solve or tool distributions in production. So 
So all these are, are small enough that we can use these current chips, but they're big enough that classical algorithms still may be too slow. And very often we don't know. So we, we make educated guesses and then we say, well, this could be a problem. And then we run it and maybe we find out that a classical algorithm is still better. But then in the end, we, we know it and we just use the classical algorithm. Um, but sometimes we find problems that um, can already benefit from, from these quantum annealing systems or from, from quantum chips. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, so the battery optimization is one initiative. Um, other kinds yes. of initiatives that Volk, Volkswagen is doing specifically as it relates to cars. Is it again? Is it yeah, allowing but, the car to park itself, or you know, what other initiatives are there? So this um, is optimization. So it's the third field that we're interested in. So the material simulation, machine learning, and then optimization, the third one. And for optimization, right now it's mostly anything um, related to optimizing mobility. So the first thing we did was, was traffic flow optimization. So we wanted to find the optimal distribution of vehicles in a um, traffic system or a traffic graph, like in a city. So such that the um, duration that it takes every vehicle to get from A to B is minimized. But um, we've continued working on that. So you know, the last thing we, we developed was um, a mobility solution that could be offered to taxi providers um, or any, any um, ride hailing company. So where we want to minimize the waiting time of each customer. So the idea is that we have a classical algorithm um, that predicts based on cell phone data, anonymized of course, but based on cell phone data, where we um, will expect demand for a mobility solution, like a taxi, a bus, or whatever. So let's say we predict in 15 minutes at um, street XY number five, um, we see five people waiting because they want to get from A to B. So this is what the classical prediction algorithm tells us. And then um, the other problem that you have to solve is, let's say you work with a taxi provider, they only have a limited number of taxis out there and uh, they're distributed all over the city. So the idea is um, use our prediction and uh, optimize the taxi fleet such that the waiting time for each customer is minimized and everyone can get his means of transportation or her means of transportation. So and uh, if we, for example, predict 100 people would be waiting for mobility solution at a certain point and we wouldn't send maybe 50 taxis but could send a bus so mm. picking up these hundred people so it's getting more and more complex and involved but um, this is what we're we're mostly concerned with so improving the mobilities or mobility in cities and uh, um, actually moving everyone through a city or um, a densely crowded area as fast as possible so and the next thing we'll we'll be working on is assigning different modes of transportation, which is, again, a very nice optimization problem. So if you imagine you have an app on your phone and you just add, I want to go from A to B, so similar um, to some map solutions that are already out there, they will tell you, well, you have to go um, take the bus and uh, from, from A to B, and then from B to C, you take the subway, and from C to D, you just walk seven minutes, whatever. Right. So, But if we want to base this on the dynamics of the real traffic out there, um, then it's more complicated. And we can't only rely on historic data. We need to optimize in, in almost real time. So and this is where a quantum chip, again, could be interesting. So if we can really solve this problem almost continuously and fast, then, again, it should help us to move everyone to the city as quickly as possible. And I guess you could use this on traffic optimization. You know, at some point, I'm sure sensors from lights and cameras on roads, you know, we'll see where all the traffic is and where it's flowing. and then. Uh... You know, yeah. you know, feedback into the city's control system. They'll be able to change traffic or change the speed of, you know, of yellow lights or red lights and the signs and move traffic differently when it needs to. Yes. Like it's, uh, you know. Okay. That could be um, interesting. Well, isn't it? Yeah. Is, uh, is Volkswagen, I guess Volkswagen is going to be using this technology for, obviously, for self-driving cars, maybe, uh, you know, for fleet management and that kind of things as well, right? Yeah, we may be. So um, one prototypical solution we developed was, so as a sort of as an additional layer um, for assigning different velocities or optimal velocities to vehicles, so speed. So imagine you you could have self-driving zones in cities. There will be this this phase of transition where not all the vehicles are self-driving. So maybe part of the fleet that's out there is self-driving and uh, part of it is still controlled by humans. But if you if you imagine you create self-driving zones in cities, then you can remove the whole traffic infrastructure. So you can remove all traffic lights. And uh, of course, the cars, they can sense what happens around them. So with LiDAR, cameras, radar, ultrasound. Um, so if something dynamic can happen, like um, a pedestrian crossing the street, then the car must sense it and brake, of course. 
But imagine you have um, an intersection without traffic lights and you want to move all the vehicles um, through this intersection coming from all directions as smoothly as possible. So you want to make sure that the trip is smooth, um, but also as close as possible. So because you want to move as many vehicles through the intersection in a um, short time as possible. So then one thing you could do is, and we could show that, that it works, is that you um, segment, for example, roads and one segment before the intersection you collect all the position data and uh, the velocities of these vehicles, and then you let the um, algorithm solve the um, speed problem. So uh, which speed limit or which velocity do I need to assign to which vehicle such that they don't crash into each other, because that would be the worst, but also make sure that the trip for all of them is as smooth as possible. So um, we wouldn't get rid of the sensors in the cars, but we would have an additional layer on top of the vehicles. So another way to solve this problem would be just let the vehicles communicate to each other, but we decided to go the other way, let it solve by a central system. Oh. So you're saying in the cities of the future, uh, there may be self-driving <laughs> zones only where, you know, the city or the government wants only self-driving, or sorry, um, only uh, computerized driving to happen and not people driving to keep traffic flowing or to keep safety happening or that kind of thing. Yes, that could be one way. So while we have this transition phase, so we're not the whole fleet out there is, is or consists of self-driving vehicles. Yeah, I could see it maybe like a school zone. You know, it would yeah. it would force vehicles in that zone to be, uh, you know, to go a certain speed. And then once you leave the zone, and you know, you can drive as like how you want. But for safety yeah. reasons, it would do that. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. There well, is Florian, one. Um, are we already out of time? <laughs> and I oh, yeah, well, yeah, there was a lot of initiatives you're working on. What was, what was the uh, the last one that you wanted to talk about? We'll cover that briefly. Yeah, so um, it's IT security. So I'm sure you've heard about um, this looming threat of quantum chips for, or quantum computers for current encryption algorithms. And we're, of course, not there yet. But still, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, so what if we have data today that's encrypted with um, a current encryption algorithm and someone steals it today? This is a problem if someone is able um, in 10 years to decrypt this data um, the, or decrypt the uh, or crack the encryption algorithm. And if it is a problem, which it is for us, then we already need to look into quantum secure algorithms today. So anything that can withstand a, a quantum attack. And this is the fourth and last area that we're very interested in. So find classical algorithms or encryption algorithms that um, help you to withstand a quantum attack. And there's one big area, it's called lattice-based encryption. Um, that's that's very popular right now, um, but um, so you know, RSA was also considered secure. So until Peter Shore came and showed with a quantum computer, it's not. So this is why we started looking into this ourselves and, and see if we or which algorithms we need to apply to our data to make sure that if someone steals it, still with a quantum computer, um, no harm can be done. Hey, that's true. Hmm. And think about that. All right. Well, very good. Um, what are some resources for listeners? Because we covered so many different areas. You know, how can they find out more about the particular areas that interest them? Um, we have a couple of publications out there. So we can. So basically, everything is on archive. Um, if you Google for Volkswagen and quantum computing, then um, most of it should show up on the first or second page. So um, I think that should help. And uh, okay. occasionally, you can see us. And giving different talks. I just heard from so our, our team is, is not spread over the whole world, but half of it is here in the US and half of it is in Germany. So anything happening in Europe is covered by the German side and everything happening here in the US and by the US side. And occasionally you can, can see one of our team members giving a talk on, on the latest work we did. All right, very good. Well, Florian, I appreciate you coming and uh, a lot of interesting new stuff you're looking at. So thank you. Thank you for your time and interest. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. 
No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.